President Obama on his last overseas trip sounds a warning over future relations with Russia. He urges his successor Donald Trump not to sacrifice America's principles over his growing ties to Vladimir Putin. My hope is that the president-elect coming in is willing to stand up to Russia where they are deviating from our values and international norms. With the world order shifting, a surprise name emerges as a possible contender for America's top diplomat, also on News at 10 tonight. If you hurry up, you'll get him. Okay. He's hell on his chaos, he stabs people and shot people. A harrowing 999 call is played to the jury at the murder trial of the man accused of killing the MP Joe Cox. Nigel Farage and his UKIP party tonight at the centre of allegations of misusing funds. We have a special report from South Africa on the desperate plight of Zimbabwean migrants. And a lunchtime rush at an Edinburgh restaurant as it serves up its second Hollywood A-lister. This is ITV News at 10 with Raggy Omar. Good evening. President Obama has pretty much kept his own counsel about his successor's policies in the nine days since American politics switched direction. But today he did speak out about Mr. Trump's stated admiration for President Putin. Mr. Obama said Mr. Trump should be ready to stand up to Russia to defend America's values and should not cut a deal with Mr. Putin over Syria that would create long-term problems in the area. Meanwhile, as the president-elect shapes the team that will deliver his policies, there is still confusion about who will get the key jobs. This is, in effect, the White House in waiting. And inside and entirely out of view, Donald Trump is forming his new administration. One key figure in this process is this former general and intelligence chief, Mike Flynn, who was fired two years ago by President Obama. It's going really well. I mean, it's a great uh, transition. And uh, the president-elect is in full control, believe me. Flynn may become the new national security advisor. Alarming for Europe because he is seen as an arch hawk on the Middle East and has shown quiet admiration for President Putin, who he sat next to at a Moscow dinner, calling him savvy and smart. It has forced President Obama, who was today in Berlin on his last overseas trip, to fire his first salvo over the bow of Donald Trump, urging him to stand up to Moscow and not do a deal on Syria or Ukraine. But my hope is, is that uh, he does not simply take a real politic approach and suggest that you know, if we just cut some deals with Russia, uh, even if it hurts people or even if it violates international norms or even if it leaves smaller countries vulnerable uh, or creates long-term problems uh, in regions like Syria, that we just do whatever is convenient at the time. I think it would be great if we get along with Russia. This is what NATO countries fear most, that under Trump, a significant accommodation of Russia is possible. In an interview this summer, Trump overlooked Putin's military involvement in Ukraine. He's not going into Ukraine, OK, just so you understand. He's not going to go into Ukraine. And he appeared sympathetic to the Russian annexation of Crimea. But, you know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. But Syria is the critical test. And as Russian forces were again today striking anti-regime targets, it appears likely that a Trump administration will join Moscow in backing President Assad. A radical shift in US policy, essentially abandoning moderate rebels. I think that, that, that Trump's definitely going to work with Putin in Syria. He, he's going to drop all of the stuff about regime change and getting rid of Assad. F f focus on terrorism, on Islamic State, and all of that. As Trump forms his administration, what all this underlines is how little we know about where American policy is going with regard to Russia and the Middle East. A startling uncertainty as this transition continues to confuse and to confound. 
In a moment, we'll be hearing what else President Obama had to say on his final European tour with our Europe editor, James Mates, in Berlin. But first, let's talk to our Washington correspondent, Robert Moore. Robert, another name in the frame tonight for the position of Secretary of State and, of all people, Mitt Romney. Yes, I mean, look, this town is suffering from kind of collective whiplashes. Ever more names, ever more uh, improbable names come forward for the top jobs. Uh, the latest uh, rumour appears to be that Mitt Romney is in serious consideration for Secretary of State. I mean, the reason, Raggy, that is so outlandish is that, of course, Mitt Romney is really the founder and the custodian of the Never Trump movement. If you remember, uh, back in March, uh, uh, Romney called uh, Trump both a phony and a fraud and said his promises were as worthless as a degree from Trump University. And there's another reason it's baffling, too. Mitt Romney has long been on the record as saying Russia is America's greatest geopolitical threat. And yet now, if, if these rumors are true, he might find himself situ sitting in the Situation Room alongside a President Trump and a National Security Advisor, Mike Flynn, who both have had notably warm words to say about uh, President Putin and about Russian policy uh, coming out of the Kremlin. So you can understand why officials here, why diplomats in this town, why foreign governments are becoming seriously confused about uh, where America is going in some of the biggest uh, strategic questions of our day. Head spinning times in Washington. Robert, thank you very much indeed. And James uh, in Berlin, extraordinary warmth at the same time and words uh, for the outgoing president as he said farewell to his German counterpart. Yes, indeed. He had already called Angela Merkel his closest partner uh, in these last eight years. Today, he heaped praise on Germany in general, Angela Merkel in particular, thanking her for her friendship, her steadfastness. Uh, you really got the feeling that he wanted to hand over the baton to Hillary Clinton, for, uh, uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, keeping the world safe and uh, uh, stable and cooperating. And unable to do that, he's handing that baton, more or less the baton of international leadership, uh, to Angela Merkel and, and her specifically. You know, Theresa May and France's President Hollande, they're both here in Berlin tomorrow. He could have said these things tomorrow and chose not to. Uh, and this is a big change. I mean, many years ago, Henry Kissinger once famously asked, you know, if I want to speak to Europe, who do I call? And what tended to happen was an incoming president would look at a map and say, well, obviously Germany. But by the time the president had left office, he had learned that the Germans didn't tend to be up for that role of leadership and the only people you could really rely on when push came to shove uh, were to be found in London. Well, not this time. It, it is quite hard to imagine uh, Barack Obama making the sort of remarks he made today about any British Prime Minister in London right now. And, you know, in a, in a world in which we keep looking at each other and say how things have changed in 2016, uh, this is another very significant difference from where we were quite recently. James, how things are changing. Thank you very much indeed. James Mates in Berlin. Well, the dizzying realignment in global alliances that James was talking about in the wake of Donald Trump becoming president-elect of America is made more startling because only a couple of weeks ago, the polls were suggesting that President Obama's foreign policy legacy would be seamlessly inherited and broadly followed by a president, Hillary Clinton. The implications of such an upheaval in international policy are immense. In his first interview on British television since the election in America, I spoke to former Foreign Secretary David Miliband, who is based in New York and now heads a major international relief agency. Just a few hours before leaving for the Middle East, David Miliband told me that with so many crises facing the world, from Syria to North Korea and with upheaval in Europe, the world needed consistency and leadership from America. That's a daunting agenda and the truth about the global system is that it's been stable when it's had consistent and clear American leadership. And the consistency and the clarity and the leadership are all important to that because American leadership is about an anchor for the global system, an anchor in values and an anchor in interests. And I think the premium over the next six to 12 months, which are always the most dangerous six to 12 months when there's a new administration just finding its sea legs, the premium is going to be on decisive and clear leadership on issues that come out of the blue but also on care and consistency in issues that are in the entree already. But it is Syria in particular that preoccupies him, where a number of relief workers from his International Rescue Committee have been killed. Syria is as close to hell as you can imagine because in addition to the terror of ISIS, you've got bombing raids from the Syrian government and from the Russian 
forces so that people feel they're stuck in a pincer movement. And across the country, there's a sense of terror and foreboding about what comes next. Do you think there are dangers for the special relationship, though? Because as much as we have to go on at the moment, I mean, Theresa May was not particularly high on President-elect Trump's uh, you know, telephone calls. Um, he spoke with Good Morning Britain's Piers Morgan for 15 minutes compared to 10 minutes with Theresa May. <laughs> it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't bode well. I think there are two dangers for the special relationship. One is that Britain turns inwards and the other is that America turns inwards. Our two countries will always have an abiding sense of common values and common interests, but the question is whether or not we do big things together in a way that's good for the world as well as good for each other. The former Foreign Secretary David Miliband talking to me a little earlier. A voice tinged with both bravery and fear echoed round the Old Bailey today. The Joe Cox murder trial was played, the 999 recording of the man who guided police towards Thomas Mayer, suspected of stabbing and shooting the MP to death. There's hell on. It's chaos, the man was heard to say. Another witness who had gone to see Mrs Cox at her constituency surgery said Mayor just walked away after killing her with not a care in the world. With Joe Cox dying in the street, CCTV shows Thomas Mayer walking away from the scene. Unbeknown to him, he's being watched and followed by a witness, Darren Playford, who's called 999 and is speaking to police. If you hurry up, you'll get him. Okay. There's hell on this chaos. He stabs people and shot people. Mayor then disappears from sight, but when he's spotted again, the witness describes a change in his appearance. Right, I can see him again. You can it see, like you can see him again. Off. He's taking yeah, his top right. off. He's got a black baseball cap. It's like the black he's baseball. He's got the black carrier bag in his right hand. So. He's got a grey shirt on. <laughs> you get a police guard at the top of there and at the bottom you'll catch him. Minutes later, Thomas Mayer is caught by police, tracked down in a quiet residential street in Bristol. Joe Cox was attacked in a bustling town centre around lunchtime. The court heard today from numerous people who witnessed the stabbing and shooting that killed the mother of two. Close enough to try and stop the violence, taxi driver Rashid Hussein approached Mayer and said to him, What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Mayer, he said, replied, Move back, otherwise I'm going to stab you. Hussein then told the jurors that he shot her twice. David Honeybell was in the library waiting to see Joe Cox in her constituency surgery. He saw her shots at close range. He said Mayor stood over her, cocked his gun and blasted her. Then he just walked away with not a care in the world. Tracy Bywood also watched Tommy Mayer leaving the bloodshed behind him. She said he was just so peaceful and calm. It was though he hadn't done anything wrong. Repeated witnesses told the jury what they say they heard during the attack on the MP. Amidst the screaming and the commotion, they described hearing the words, Britain first. Mayor denies all the charges against him and listened quietly as successive witnesses outlined their recollection of that day and the moment they saw the MP gunned down and stabbed in the street. Rupert Evelyn, News at 10 at the Old Bailey. Back in the general election of May last year and the EU referendum vote this year, UKIP invested time and money carrying out opinion polls. So far, so predictable. Why wouldn't they? But a leaked report says some of the money which came from the European Parliament was misused by UKIP for campaigning. Now the EU Parliament wants £150,000 back. Nigel Farage casting his vote at the general election. Today, a leaked European Parliament report alleges funds were misused in constituencies where UKIP wanted to campaign hard. It says a group called ADDE, in which UKIP is a leading member, paid for polling which would help UKIP out of funds not meant for campaign work. The chairman of ADDE, a UKIP politician, says they've done nothing wrong. We went out of our way, we leant over backwards to make sure that we spent it correctly because we knew that we'd be subject to very, very close scrutiny. We hired not one but two compliance officers with years of experience working in the Parliament with the Parliament rulebook and they signed off every piece of activity. 
The report found that ADDE financed polling in the UK between February and December last year in constituencies which included UKIP target seats like Thurrock and Great Grimsby. It claims the total amount of money misspent on UKIP's behalf was £387,000. It's pretty scandalous behaviour and it's going to be really important that uh, Mr Farage uh, and uh, the rest of his colleagues at UKIP come forward with a clear explanation. I don't think they're going to be able to find one uh, and I think this could potentially be a matter for the police. If the report is upheld on Monday, then UKIP's parliamentary group faces a bill of nearly £150,000, money they say they don't have. UKIP are entitled to use European parliamentary resources like this office building, but the money in question was not meant to be used for political campaigning. Tonight, Nigel Farage told me that's not what they'd been doing anyway, and he said that the European Parliament had changed the way it interprets the rules in order to damage UKIP. UKIP's parliamentary group, ADDE, say they will be taking the matter to the European Court of Justice. Carl Dinan News at 10, Westminster. It seems the great British shopper wasn't spooked, after all, by the Brexit doom-mongers. The scary predictions, if anything, seem to have persuaded people to get out and spend. A boom in buying for Halloween was one of the factors. Sales in October rose at their fastest annual rate for 14 years, from 3.8% last October to 7.4% this year. Internet sales also had their strongest growth for five years, up almost 27%. With all the negative headlines warning us about the effect of Brexit on the economy, you might have thought that the British public would have started reining in their spending. But instead, it seems that, if anything, we're shopping more. That's certainly the case here in Chelmsford. I think everything's more or less the same really for us at the moment. So I don't think, you know, until we see changes uh, in mortgage payments, anything like that, there's no point. We might as well just carry on the way we are. You can't worry too much, can you, about <laughs> what's going to happen in the future, drive yourself potty. It's important to keep today today and yeah. live for the day. You know, don't worry about tomorrow. Analysts say the main reasons for the increased growth in October was an unusually warm September, meaning people put off buying winter clothing until last month's cold snap. There was also record spending on Halloween and the weak pound meant more tourists came to our shores to shop. There's also the theory that people could be spending more now because they fear that inflation looms. Well, I think that people are, really haven't seen the impact of price rises yet. And obviously with the idea that knowing that prices will go up or if the public accepts that prices will go up, then that will help bring forward spending. But why we shop isn't just a function of the environment. It's also a function of what's going on in our heads. People suffer from something called myopia. Essentially, it means short-sightedness. We don't take the future into account as much as we should when making our decisions. So we might know that next year, potentially, there will be a recession. Businesses have been scaling back investment. The government has just told us that they're going to be, uh, have a £100 billion budget hole. But people make their decisions based on the money in their pockets today. How do they feel right now? Look how busy this high street is. And why wouldn't it be? Unemployment is at its lowest level in a decade. Wages continue to increase. It might seem as if the referendum vote hasn't harmed the economy at all. But look around the corner and the picture is very different. We know that prices are going to go up as the effect of the weak pound filters through and that wages are not going to increase at the same rate. And what that means in practice is that before too long, we're all going to be feeling the squeeze. Christmas presents may be what's on our minds right now, but next week the Chancellor delivers his autumn statement and many will be wondering just how generous he can be. Narina Hertz, News at 10, Chelmsford. If you are watching News at 10 on Monday, you may remember our latest report about vulnerable children being groomed not for sex, but as drug runners. Today, the National Crime Agency confirmed that these new gang-run distribution networks, which we highlighted, have been detected in nearly three quarters of police forces in England and Wales. 
Many of the Hillsborough families believe he is defending the indefensible. But today, the last serving senior police officer who was on duty at Hillsborough, Sir Norman Betterson, has been explaining why he has written a book giving his account of the disaster, which left 96 Liverpool fans dead. Sir Norman says he has unfairly taken the blame over claims of a conspiracy to frame supporters for the disaster. The victims' families say he is looking for sympathy he doesn't deserve. I've been described as a monster. And the context for that description is Hillsborough. Accused of being part of an organised attempt by South Yorkshire Police to smear the victims of Hillsborough, Norman Betterson has always pleaded his innocence and now he's written a book about the damage to his reputation. You've written a book about Hillsborough, which is effectively a book about yourself and you're styling yourself as the victim here. How do you have the neck to do that? No, that's, that's, that, that, well, that isn't fair because I... I I go to great lengths to demonstrate the empathy that I have for the, uh, for, the, for the families. Norman Betterson was off duty attending the match when the Hillsborough disaster unfolded. He says he helped with the police response on the day. But in the weeks that followed, he was assigned to a team that collected officers' statements, many of those statements deeply critical of fans' behaviour. Victoria and Sarah Hicks were fans who died at Hillsborough. Their father has no respect for a man at the heart of the police response to the tragedy, a response that compounded his family's grief. He should be stripped of his knighthood and he should be just plain old Norman. Plain old Norman? Plain old Norman. He should go away, he should stop looking for sympathy that he doesn't deserve and he should stop trying to give us sympathy that we don't want when it's not meant. Few here in Liverpool expect the book to be a bestseller. This bookshop wouldn't stock it, even if they thought anyone would buy it. The idea that he has something to say that he could not have already said in those 27 years when the truth was needed um, is laughable, really. And to be honest, it's an insult to Liverpool and to all of the families. At one stage, he was the chief constable of Merseyside Police. He says he wants people in Liverpool who blame him for a cover-up to read his book and change their minds. For the last 100 pages, you're bleating, effectively, about what's happened to your good name. Not bleating. Um, setting the story straight. Wouldn't any of us, wouldn't you, actually care if people were saying things about you that weren't true? Liverpool isn't buying it, but the Independent Police Complaints Commission has a copy and has yet to conclude its investigations. The last word of Norman Betterson's story will be with them. Damon Green, News at 10, Liverpool. The publishers of Sir Norman's book say the money it makes will be donated to charity. It was the Prime Minister who said FIFA should sort out their own house before telling us what to do, but that hasn't stopped world football's bosses starting disciplinary proceedings against England and Scotland for wearing armbands with poppies on for their World Cup qualifying match on Armistice Day. It could mean both nations end up being fined or even losing points. Next tonight, when millions of people stream out of their country, it's fair to say something must be seriously wrong. No, not Syria this time. In fact, it is what should be a prosperous African country. Yet Zimbabwe is anything but. There will be yet more anti-government protests in the capital Harare tomorrow. Not that the man who has presided over Zimbabwe's desperate decline, President Robert Mugabe, will take any notice. Because of the chaotic state of the country, precise economic figures are often impossible to confirm, but unemployment is widely regarded to be as high as 95%. The World Food Programme says 4 million people are malnourished and do not have enough to eat. And because their lives are so pitiful, up to 3 million of the country's 16 million population are estimated to have fled to neighbouring South Africa to work illegally, many thousands scraping a living from abandoned gold mines. This is Robert Mugabe's generation. His people forced into exile to grind out a living from rocks and dust. They've abandoned nation and family for this, backbreaking illegal labor. So imagine what misery they've left behind. My child sometimes is going to sleep. Sometimes she's gonna sleep for two days. She didn't eat because there's no food. Down there, amid the ruins of a once thriving mining village, 
there are thousands toiling. A pitiful reenactment of a gold rush that once made fortunes. This, this is a point. This is gold here. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's tiny, it's tiny. Johannesburg was literally built on gold, but the rich seams under the city are exhausted. Still, down into the wasteland left behind, step desperate Zimbabweans, illegal miners known as Zama Zamas. This life is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Zimbabwe's economy is down. So here in South Africa, most people, they are jobless. That's why I'm going underground. Wellington and his friend will spend two lonely weeks in this mine long abandoned and dream of a lucky strike. But most dig for a few dollars. For others, it's a death trap. For a few down here, the rewards can be generous, but everyone knows the enormous risk. Something like 20 Zama Zama miners are killed every year. No one knows for sure because nobody counts them. Officially, these men don't even exist. They're ghosts. I'm scared, says Bongani. The ground shakes and the rocks fall. Worst are the poison gases. You cannot breathe. At the same mine, two months passed, the bodies of illegal miners were recovered from a collapsed shaft. Many are never found. Faith's brother was killed in an accident, leaving his family and children without support. I pray God will somehow lead us to a better life, she says, but I don't know how and I don't know when. What gold they find will make necklaces and rings symbols of success, but they're stuck here without hope, a long way from home. John Ray News at 10, Johannesburg. The Zimbabwean's migrant force in South Africa. Now, it was a year ago this week that George Clooney popped into a sandwich bar in Edinburgh with the help for homeless connections and caused pandemonium. Nothing like that was ever likely to happen again, was it? Well, actually, yes. Today, Leonardo DiCaprio popped into an Edinburgh restaurant, part of the same foundation. Cue mass hysteria. With a cool wave for his screaming fans, OK, and maybe some excited journalists, Hollywood royalty arrived in Scotland's capital. Some here had queued since five o'clock this morning to get this close. But if you ask them, they'll say it was worth it. Did Leo touch your tattoo? He did sign it, yeah. Oh, how, how does that make you feel? Uh, overwhelmed and very, very, very happy. Amazing. <laughs> what was he like? So lovely. He smelled lovely. Oh, he smelled lovely. Yeah, he smelled lovely, yeah. Were you that close? Yeah, yeah, yeah. when he walked by I was like, oh. An apparently pleasantly fragranced Leo then went for lunch in a restaurant run by Josh Littlejohn of Social Bite. They employ people who've been homeless. George Clooney's visit last year was followed by a huge boost in donations. This place is great. Fantastic, you guys. Raising £365,000 in just two weeks. And the brains behind all of this has only just turned 30. George Clooney last year, Leonardo DiCaprio this year, these are celebrities that any charity would love to have involved. How do you get them? Well, we invite them to Scotland. I think Scotland's got a romantic notion people want to come here. Um, and whilst he's here, we invite them to come and to a smaller extent champion our own cause, uh, which is visiting this restaurant and meeting some of the guys that now work here that came from backgrounds of homelessness. These three chefs all used to be homeless. Today, they were cooking for an Oscar winner with one golden rule. <laughs> After all that pressure, the chefs got a photograph. Another happy customer. Biffy was serving Leo today and she kept a few mementos. I have the glass that he drank from, as you can see, DNA. I have his been name card. And I have his autograph. After Clooney and now DiCaprio, Excitement is already building over who Social Bite might bring over next year. Peter Smith, News at 10, Edinburgh. Who next indeed? Just before we go, time for a look at what's happening tomorrow. Theresa May might feel like the guest no one wants to talk to at a party. At a meeting in Berlin, she is due to meet the leaders of the other main EU countries, Germany, France, Italy and Spain. There'll be news of something happening at or to Buckingham Palace. Quite what remains under wraps till midday. 
And the dress that Marilyn Monroe wore when she famously sang Happy Birthday to President Kennedy is up for auction in Los Angeles late tomorrow night. I'll be here again tomorrow. Till then, from all of us on the programme, good night.